So the next chapter, chapter 16, is about the Gilded Age. And the Gilded Age is a really interesting time period because it's about success in the United States. It's about growth and expansion. It's about innovation. It's about um, all sorts of positive things, but it's also about the ugliness, uh, the underside uh, of those same things. And so you're going to see two very different Americas. Uh, you're going to see the positive side of America, the positive side of capitalism, the positive side of uh, of expansion, but you're also, also going to see the ugly side of it. And that's why the theme of this particular lecture is superficial success, because there is success, but only to a certain extent, right? It's only on a certain level of uh, of success. Um, so I want to start by talking about where that term Gilded Age comes from. Uh, the Gilded Age was actually created uh, by Mark Twain. Mark Twain, the great American writer, um, is the guy who comes up with this term. Uh, Mark Twain is interesting because um, he is at the core of uh, his very identity, he is an observer, right? He's just watching everyone and everything. And at his uh, observations, he is honest. And what he sees uh, is all of this success. And then he tells you exactly what he sees in all of the success. And when we talk about that word gilded, gilded, if you were to look it up in the dictionary, is basically an adjective that's uh, that's describing a very thin covering, right? So it's like, um, if you're familiar at all with decoration, it's like taking gold leaf and covering something with gold leaf or gold paint. Um, you're taking something that's easily, uh, that can easily be peeled off or scraped off. It's uh, something that covers something else, right? So it's a thin covering, a thin veil that's covering something else. And what the Gilded Age was a comment on from Mark Twain was that you have this very thin veil of uh, something shiny and pretty and golden that shows you success on the outside, but on the inside, it's ugly and it's depressing and it's not very pretty or successful at all. Um, and in fact, if you get into other definitions, uh, what it's also referred to is uh, as a thin veneer. And if you're familiar at all with dental work or dentistry in any way, um, you may have heard of dental veneers, which is something that dentists will use to um, help fix or straighten out your teeth. And I've had dentists, uh, my dentist explained to me what veneers will do. Uh, and she said what they do is they um, shape down your actual existing teeth into pointy edges to make your teeth look like almost like an animal. Um, so all your original teeth um, look like little pointed uh, teeth. And then the veneers are shaped to fit your mouth, but then they cover what's actually there. So if your veneers are chipped or they fall off, you will actually see what's underneath, which is your real tooth, your real bones. And so that's what's actually happening here. Mark Twain says, listen, on the outside looking in, everything looks great. You see the economy booming, you see railroads everywhere, you see jobs, you see people with money and wealth, and everything looks great. But if you were to come inside, what you would see is people living in extreme poverty. You would you would see racism, you would see overcrowded cities, you would see um, greed, you would see political corruption, and you would see a lot of ugliness that people were trying to cover up. Um, and so with that in mind, 
I want to talk about um, how all of this is possible. So when we talk about the Gilded Age, let's start by talking about the Second Industrial Revolution, which um, our author get, starts getting into on page 605 of the textbook with uh, the industrial economy. So when we talk about um, industrialization, especially the se second industrial revolution, this is gonna come up more uh, as we go further along the timeline. But when we talk about the industrial economy, this is not something that's just happening in the United States. This is something that's happening here, but it's also happening throughout Europe as well. Um, you have more and more people who are leaving their farms and leaving agriculture and moving to the cities. So here in the United States, people are leaving agriculture and leaving their um, typical jobs or leaving their typical lives and going to where the real jobs are, uh, which which is in larger cities, right? And they're not going into the cities that you're typically thinking of. They're not just going to Boston and New York. They're going into newer cities with new industries. So this is going to be places like Chicago, Pittsburgh, and Detroit, because in these new cities, you have new industries and new places with new ideas to work, which uh, is what Phonar gets into. And not only are you dealing with these new industries, um, you also have these new opportunities, right? So with these new opportunities, we're talking about industries that are going to develop new chemicals. Um, you have everything from um, chemical plants to food industries. You're also going to have the development of new weapons, which put a star by that because that's going to come up later on. Um, you're also going to have the development of um, industries like steel, uh, which is going to come up uh, in a really big way. Uh, so that's going to be incredibly important as well. Um, what's also going to be incredibly, incredibly important will be railroads and the development of a truly national market here in the United States. Railroads are so significant for us, primarily because um, in the United States, up until this point, uh, the, the United States is essentially a regional country. You have the North, you have the Midwest, you have the South, you might have parts of the West, but it's not necessarily a truly national country that's been unified. Uh, what unifies it uh, will be the railroads. Railroads will make travel easier. It'll make communications easier. It'll make businesses uh, connecting easier. Railroads will be what unifies the country once and for all. It creates a unified national market, which is something that Eric Foner will explain um, on pages 606 to 607. And one of the things that you need to keep in mind is that you cannot underestimate the importance of railroads. They are so important that it's the reason why we have time zones. That's how important railroads are. The, so the reason we have time zones is because railroads needed to be able to establish when they would arrive in certain cities um, so that they could create, okay, this is when we would be able to pick up certain things for different businesses. And so the government goes according to what railroad companies and railroad owners wanted. Railroad companies and railroad owners shifted politics. They ran what the government would do and what the government would push for in terms of policy. That's how powerful railroads were in this country. Not only that, but when we talk about the Gilded Age, uh, what's also incredibly important here is innovation. Um, so these are, when we're talking about innovation during the Gilded Age, this is where you're going to learn uh, about guys like uh, Tesla and Thomas Edison, uh, these guys and others like them, and there are plenty of others, but Tesla and Edison are the two prominent names. Uh, these guys are encouraged and supported um, to push themselves in creating uh, and innovating ideas, not just on um, 
inventing things just for the sake of inventing, but also creating ideas for efficiency, right? How to make uh, life easier, how to um, create sources of entertainment, create uh, resources for how to work longer hours, right? The idea of uh, running electricity 24 hours a day so that factories could be open even at nighttime, uh, people could work, people could um, work at night or read at night. These these sort of things are incredibly important as well. You're going to have ideas on how to make businesses uh, more competitive, more effectively run. Um, and all of these ideas are going to lead to um, the fact that the you have business owners and businessmen who will take advantage of uh, economic opportunities and loopholes in the law to make more money for themselves. And those guys, especially in this time period, will be known as robber barons. Robber barons were men who, businessmen in particular, who not only enjoyed economic opportunities, but also enjoyed political influence. Um, and Foner talks about uh, a couple in particular, uh, Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller. These guys in particular are set aside primarily because uh, these two men not only uh, were robber barons, but they created ways on how to become as uh, economically successful and powerful as they were. Uh, Andrew Carnegie uh, was a titan in the steel industry. Uh, he is incredibly important uh, because of how he incorporated something called vertical integration. That is his idea. Um, Foner talks about it in greater detail on page 609. Uh, Rockefeller, on the other hand, is a titan in uh, terms of oil. Um, he will get into other businesses as well, but Rockefeller is primarily known for oil. He incorporates vertical integration as well, but he will also incorporate his own idea of horizontal expansion. Um, and he is someone who um, will at one point control 90% of the oil industry in the United States. 90%. When we talk about robber barons in this country, robber barons, as Foner explains on page 611, will have an extreme amount of power without any kind of accountability. Nobody uh, says to them, you can't exercise that level of power, that level of economic control uh, in this country. Uh, you can't have control of 90% of the oil in this country without some level of accountability. Um, nobody says that to them because quite frankly, there is no law at that point that says that, right? So they're able to wield that level of power um, without anyone stopping them. Uh, and that's the ugliness that Mark Twain is talking about, right? Because here you have these men who exercise all of this power, who have literally hundreds of millions and millions of dollars, and it gets into this question of, okay, but what's it like for regular Americans? What is their lives like? And that's when we get into the question of the social problem uh, in the Gilded Age. What is it like for regular Americans who are working as, uh, you know, regular Joes, regular people? And that's getting into uh, what Foner talks about on page 613. So make sure this is picking up on page 613, Freedom in the Gilded Age, uh, where he talks about the social problem. And he talks about specifically um, what the economic classes are like, right? And he's issuing especially this idea that, um, that there are respectable classes versus the um, dangerous classes, right? That the respectable classes are the ones who carry themselves better, whereas the dangerous classes were the ones who didn't know how to clean themselves or how to take care of themselves. And they were just unfortunately so poor. Well, 
uh, if they had access to better things and opportunities, maybe they could carry themselves a little bit better, right? That leads to the whole concept of social Darwinism in America, and that's on page 615. Social Darwinism is especially important in the Gilded Age because it's this belief, this idea that you were responsible for your own luck, that um, your society, your circumstances really had uh, no say in your life. It was really just you and your luck that if you're, that it's basically natural selection, but applied to your own life. Um, and sometimes life just sucks and that's why you're poor. Uh, but there's no thought to, you know, whether or not you uh, were ever given an opportunity, right? There's no thought to uh, whether or not you were given an opportunity to go to school, no thought to whether or not you were given an opportunity to um, uh, to learn how to read or write, to, uh, to ever actually try or given a chance to, um, to do more than what you were, you were given, right? This is the problem, you know, uh, it's the whole idea of survival of the fittest, except it's as if your counterpart was given all of these opportunities and you weren't. So it's not really survival of the fittest, right? Um, that's, that's the issue. But when we are talking about, um, this whole idea of, social Darwinism, it's its really, really unfair. Um, we go from that to the whole idea of the concept of the liberty of contract, which Foner gets into on page 616. And when we talk about the liberty of contract, um, what that means is, is that, you know, we're getting into this whole idea that um, we are going into this place of the foundation of civilization as um, uh, that we have an obligation um, as some reformers were wanting to, to get into that workers should be able to at least have an opportunity to fend for themselves, to defend themselves, to be able to protect themselves, right? That's the whole idea of the liberty of contract, to be able to, um, you know, define um, the the idea of of being able to protect themselves uh, in the workplace. Um, and Foner talks about that. He starts by talking about that on page six sixteen, and then goes into it in more detail on page six seventeen because it is going to become an issue before the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, "Well, listen, you know, you can." Uh, try to protect yourself, and um, it's just not going to work because, you know, at the end of the day, once you decide that you are going to um, work for this person, that person has control and say over how you're supposed to work. Um, at the same time, uh, there's a lot of back and forth about the rights of businesses versus the rights of workers, um, and it gets a really it gets really problematic uh, because at the end of the day, uh, you have to realize that the government is only going to do so so much uh, to protect the worker, especially when you consider how much influence businesses have. Um, it really sort of points to the fact that there's a lot of uh, resentment and uh a lot of uh, unrest uh, among workers, among working people, right? Um, and that's really where we run into um, this issue about um, about workers' rights. And on page 619, we get into the story of the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor um, is uh, a union. Uh, the Knights of Labor being one of the largest unions in the country at that point in the 1880s. And they were really the first group, as Foner points out, the first group to try and organize unskilled workers. Uh, they also try to organize women and um, skilled workers all together. But the Knights of Labor is important in this particular context because um, they are going to push for this concept of um, the conditions essential to liberty. And the idea of this concept in this essay is that 
in order to really be able to be free, right? In order to be a free American, in order to truly be a free citizen, a part of that is that you should be able to work as free men and be able to not be taken advantage of and be dominated by another class, right? That your liberty should not be dominated by somebody else, that you should not be treated by like second-class citizens. Remember what I told you in the previous lecture, that freedom is layered, right? Freedom is not just freedom as a concept. Freedom is political freedom, it's, uh, uh, it's social freedom, and it's economic freedom. And that's what they're talking about here. Uh, and so, uh, that's going to lead me to this idea um, that he addresses on page 623 about the social gospel. The social gospel is the complete opposite of social Darwinism, right? The social gospel is driven by the Protestant belief that the Christian belief or the Protestant belief that when you are advocating and uh, advocating for reform, that you can't just think about yourself, that this is about appealing to and fighting for not just the individual yourself, but the community, the people around you, right? That this is not just about survival of the fittest, that this is about what is best for, you, uh, for everyone around you, right? When we talk about the social gospel, the whole idea is how do we alleviate poverty? How do we make sure that child labor uh, is eliminated altogether, right? So suddenly now we are not talking about just the liberty of oneself. We are talking about the liberty of all people. What is best for everyone and not just for the one person at the heart, uh, at the heart and soul of this story? Um, when we talk about how disenchanted the workers are here at the soul of the Gilded Age, uh, nothing really tells the story better than the Haymarket Affair uh, in 1886. So on page 623, uh, Foner talks about what happens uh, at, at Haymarket, which is uh, in Chicago. Um, and essentially at the heart and soul of this story is a, a union strike, right, of, of Haymarket. And it's something that leads to a complete violence. You have to read it for yourself. But essentially, what it's, what is at the heart and soul of it is, a, you know, workers who are frustrated and overwhelmed. And then there's a bombing that takes place in Haymarket. But it's a reflective of the frustration that workers have been feeling, not just in Chicago, but across the country. Now, when we talk about it, let me go back for a second. When we talk about this frustration, workers, um, workers are going to be blamed for it by business owners who, uh, and these business owners are going to say, well, it's these foreigners. These foreigners from Europe are anarchists, they're communists, they're socialists, they're anti-American, and they're here to disrupt our way of lives. And you are going to hear that consistently. You're going to hear this in the Gilded Age. You're going to hear this in the 1910s. You're going to hear this in the 1920s. You're going to hear this all the time. They are anti-American. They hate capitalism. But the reality is, is they are tired of being taken advantage of. They are tired of living in abject poverty. They are tired of living, um, of barely getting by. And they are tired of being taken advantage of. That's what this is really all about. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, this goes back to the whole idea of the gildedness of the Gilded Age, and that is um, the transformation of the American West, right? The transformation of the American West really points to this whole idea that, you know, the West is being settled finally by this great American vision. And if you'll notice this painting um, that I've included here on the slide, it's supposed to sort of represent um, this divine calling uh, that people truly believed had been placed on the Americans to conquer the West, right? You see this figure here in the middle of the painting um, where this 
divine angel like being is sort of leading the way west and the light is illuminating from her um, as she is leading everyone west right um and uh, as Foner explains on pages 626 and 627 you know the west has all of these opportunities um to create a new life, to create new economic opportunities, including in agriculture and in mining. You have all of these opportunities to make money, and it's sold as a way for regular people to go out there and start all over, create a new life for themselves. When in reality, for all of these places, whether it's farming, mining, um, or even with ranching, what ends up happening is you have large corporations going out to the West claiming huge amounts of land for themselves and then hiring uh, regular people to work for them and taking advantage of those poor people. And you have some regular people getting land for themselves, but living in what? poverty. Uh, like, for example, when we talk about cowboys and the corporate West, which he talks about on uh, page 630, uh, to be a cowboy in the American West is to live a very dangerous and extremely impoverished life. In fact, when corporations advertise uh, for cowboys, they made sure that on the advertisements, they um, asked for uh, single men who were orphans because the likelihood of you dying as a cowboy uh, was extremely high and they would prefer that you had no family of any kind so that they wouldn't have to identify uh, they wouldn't have to call your family and let them know that you've been uh, killed in the west being a cowboy uh, and they could just bury you somewhere along one of the trails and then call it good uh, it was not fun being a cowboy However, uh, when we talk about, you know, uh, the whole idea of settling the West, whatever that means, a part of the process was the subjugation of the Plains Indians, which he talks about on page 633. The whole idea of this conquering the American West meant the absolute violence that took place uh, uh, along the, uh, throughout the West, throughout the Plains especially, where you had hundreds and hundreds of people dying uh, because their way of life was destroyed, uh, especially in the deaths of uh, hundreds of thousands of, or millions, I should say, uh, millions of buffalo and hundreds of thousands of people. Um, all of this sort of accumulated into uh, the myth of the, the uh, and the creation of the myth of the Wild West, right? Because you know, when you think of the West of the 1800s, you think of uh, the quote unquote cowboy and Indian, right? Or cowboys and Indians. And the reality is, is life sucked for both of them, right? Because you did not want to be a cowboy. Being a cowboy meant that your life was not valued. Your life was constantly in danger. You were scrawny and skinny. You were underfed. Your life was not valued at all. In fact, you were told from the very beginning that if it's your life or the cattle's life, you were supposed to, you were expected to put your life on the line um, so that the cattle's life was saved. So cattle was more valued than you. And if you were Native American, well, then forget it. You weren't valued at all. You weren't respected at all. Your culture wasn't valued at all or respected at all uh, and because you were not considered civilized, right? So when we talk about the mythology of the, of the West, the mythology of the West contributed to the identity of being an American, but there was no truth to any of that. It contributed to the idea of the Gilded Age, but the reality of the West showed the ugliness of the Gilded Age, right? So again, on the outside, you're seeing, oh, look at all, uh, look at the heroism, right? On the outside, it's like this painting. On the outside, 
you see the beauty of it. It's the woman leading you out west so that you can civilize and settle the west. But in reality, it's ugly. It's dangerous. It's just corporations settling the west and regular people living out in misery. It's not the pretty picture that everyone believed it to be. And so the question you're left to ask is, well, if things were that bad, why aren't politicians fixing it? Why aren't, why isn't the government stepping in to change what's going on? You know, if there are robber barons out there making all of this money and taking advantage of the workers, if there are cowboys who are dying and Indians who are being killed. Why isn't anyone stepping up to fix it? The answer is because politics has been poisoned, right? It's completely corrupt. And this cartoon is a perfect explanation and demonstration for that. So this cartoon is basically uh, a depiction of the Senate. And you'll notice that everyone who is small Every person who is small there, and I'll, let me see if I can show it with my pen. So all of these people right here represent the senators. But when we talk about uh, these guys in the back, all of these really, really big guys, those guys represent special interests. Those are the trusts. So you'll have the steel industry, the copper industry, the railroads. All of those guys are really big because uh, their money speaks on their behalf. So no matter what, you can't escape their influence, right? They loom large, literally. <laughs> so when we talk about how uh, influential they are, you can't really escape them in, in Gilded Age politics. And that's the problem. That's really the issue here. Um, and, and that's really problematic when you want to be able to um, take uh, take a chance and and work on really bringing about change. You can't really do it because in the Gilded Age, they don't want you to do it. Um, it's especially, uh, it's also problematic because in the Gilded Age, you have something called political bosses. Um, and if you are familiar at all with Martin Scorsese's film, uh, Gangs of New York, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. Political bosses are guys who essentially control how senators, congressmen, mayors, governors, how they vote, how they uh, run their governments, everything. But not only do they control how politicians run the show, they also control how voters vote. Because during the Gilded Age, there is no such thing as a secret ballot. So you're going to vote how they tell you to vote. So political bosses control everything. There is another problem, though, and Foner talks about this on page 643, and that is the politics of dead center, meaning people who are in the middle of every issue. They're not liberal, but they're not conservative. They're sort of in the middle of everything. And the reason why that's problematic is because you need the you need liberals and you need conservatives so that there is debate if there's no debate, then there's no room for compromise. If everybody's in the middle on everything, then there's no conversation that's taking place. And if there's no conversation and there's no debate, then where is everybody going to go? There's no room to really move. There's no room to really talk. And there's no room to really push each other. And that's really problematic too, because where is there to go from, right? That's a problem especially in American politics, and especially at this time when there's so many other places to go. Okay, so with that in mind, I do want to mention one last thing, and that is uh, the fact that there are reform legislations that have been passed, and that's mentioned on page 645, because even though the Gilded Age is somewhat useless in reform politics, they are, there are some big things mentioned, including the Sherman Antitrust Act. And the Sherman Antitrust Act, even though it isn't enforced, it is on the books. 
And that's going to be important, particularly for our next lecture.